Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, event organized by the Hellenic Observatory at the London School of Economics. And it's my great pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. Othon Anastasakis and Dr. Fotini Kaladzi, who will be discussing crisis and change, the right of the Greek citizens to vote abroad. Now, as uh, all of you will know, uh, this particular um, topic uh, comes on the back of the vote in the Greek parliament in 2019 which by an overwhelming majority uh, allowed the Greeks of the diaspora to vote from their place of residence. And today's speakers who are working on a research project uh, on this particular topic are gonna to share uh, their ideas and arguments about the context for this vote and what it means, uh, what it could mean for the uh, Greek diaspora in the future uh, um, electoral cycle in Greece. Let me briefly introduce our speakers today and then do a bit of uh, housekeeping. Uh, our first speaker today is Dr. Othon Anastasakis, uh, who is obviously well known to all of you uh, in his capacity as the Director of Southeast European Studies at Oxford, the acronym is CSOX. Uh, Othon is a Senior Research Fellow at St. Anthony's College, and he teaches on Southeast European politics and European integration and EU politics. And he is currently the Principal Investigator on two projects very relevant to today's presentation, the Greek Diaspora Project and, the Tur and Turkey's Migration Diplomacy. Our second speaker today is Dr. Fotini Kaladzi, who is the A.G. Levendis Research Officer at the Diaspora Project in CSOX at St. Anthony's College, uh, Oxford University. Her work focuses on the Greek diaspora, uh, homeland interrelationship. She also includes research on secur securitization of migration in Europe with a focus uh, on Greece. And she's one of the researchers in the Migration Diplomacy and Turkish EU Relations Project of the Oxford Berlin Research Partnership. Uh, for those of you who are inclined to tweet, uh, Twitter users, please use the hashtag for today's event, at LSE Greece. The event is being recorded and will be made available later as a podcast through the Hellenic Observatory website. If you have uh, questions, and I hope you do have a lot of questions for what promises to be a stimulating presentation, please put them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and I will transfer the questions to the speakers. Uh, and I would just like to remind you that even though this is our last research seminar of the academic year, we do have another forthcoming event very soon on Monday, the 22nd of March, The Left in Power, Reflections on Syriza's Promise and Achievements. And the speaker in that particular event is Efklidis Sakalotos, who is also very well known to all of you. So without further ado, uh, let me please hand you over to Dr. Othon Anastasakis, who's going to be speaking first on today's topic of crisis and change, the right of Greek citizens to vote abroad, often. Thank you very much, Spiro, for the introduction and for hosting us. It's always a pleasure for me to uh, present our work at the Hellenic Observatory. Um, I would like to thank you and RT uh, at Stairwood for um, uh, hosting this. And uh, as I said, I mean, for me, it's great pleasure because uh, I've been at the Hellenic Observatory for four years uh, during the initial years. And it's always kind of with the fondest memories um, uh, that I come even, you know, in this kind of digital form uh, to present work. Now, the current presentation that Fotini and I will be presenting today uh, is part of a wider program, uh, our CSOX diaspora program, which we established at CSOX uh, uh, five years ago. And it's about Greek diaspora and how homeland diaspora relations developed during the economic crisis and beyond. Uh, we are a team of researchers and a network of scholars who have been looking at different aspects of contemporary diaspora, including political engagement with homeland, philanthropic giving and NGO support, brain drain and brain circulation. Uh, we've been mapping diaspora associations and organizations and we have conducted surveys on the Greeks in the UK during the crisis, but also follow up uh, even up to now during the pandemic. So this particular presentation is related to one pillar of our research on the political engagement, which deals with the Greek state and the Greek political elites and their policies with diaspora and includes work on the institutional architecture of diasporic engagement, the positions and practices of political parties vis-a-vis -vis diaspora, and um, the main issues that have emerged in this relationship during uh, the crisis and beyond. Our focus today is on the issue of the diasporic vote, 
as this became a central feature of political engagement and one of the most important outputs of the crisis. Now, we usually understand periods of crisis as times of uh, hurtful and negative change, blow to progress and development. But from a more optimistic perspective, crisis can also be an opportunity for change in some areas. And indeed, in the field of the Greek state's relationship with diaspora, many fronts suffered as a result of the crisis and the severe austerity. Consulates, for instance, they saw their budgets shrink. The Council of the Hellenes Abroad, as is known, SAE, fell into irrelevance. State funds for cultural and educational purposes had to be reduced. The interest and in financial commitments of many prominent diaspora uh, individual or businesses wavered in view of the huge debt that saw the country's finances look like a bottomless pit. And yet, the December 2019 law on the facilitation of the expat vote was actually voted by an overwhelming majority in the parliament of 288 out of 300. And that happened 44 years after the right to uh, vote uh, for Greek citizens uh, was first introduced in the Greek constitution for citizens abroad. And that was a breakthrough moment um, in diaspora homeland political relations, this December 2019 law, uh, as well as one of the rare moments of parliamentary consensus across the board. First slide, please. Now, our presentation today, Fotini and I, will be discussing why and how this happened through the tracing of the, the micropolitics of policy change. I will start with the conceptual and the historical discussion, and then Fotini will follow with a more empirical presentation of our work. Now, in our presentation, we adopt three propositions which form the core of our argument, but also our research agenda. First, that the crisis acted as a critical juncture with a transformative potential. The second, that internal and to some degree as well external actors were mobilized towards this goal. And third, the internationally widespread application of the diasporic vote left Greece as an outlier who, while granting the right of vote to its citizens around the world, it had refused for so many decades to supply for the facilitation of the vote abroad, thus asking voters to travel to Greece in order to exercise their right. Next slide, please. Now, this diagram that you see here, it shows a tentative causality, which presents the diasporic vote as the kind of starting point and looks at three intervening variables and how these relate to each other. The first one is crisis as a critical juncture. And uh, that critical juncture con contains a severe economic downturn, a political shakeup uh, of party politics, and uh, a very big immigration wave. The second variable is agency in the form of political party as the central kind of agents of change in, that, um, uh, in this respect media in creating the atmospheric and the debate environment, and then diaspora actors as that pressure from uh, that side of things. And the third one, the international context, which is the increasing um, influence of the practice rather of uh, global uh, voting. Uh, then some legal cases that also were particularly significant in terms of um, uh, creating uh, some kind of understanding of what's happening as well as the European elections, which uh, created a contradiction with the national elections. I will speak more about that. Uh, so the interaction of these three was a uh, sufficient and necessary conditions leading to change to our dependent variable, the institutional change and the facilitation of the uh, of voting. Our work is country specific, but it's also generalizable and comparative to other cases. It uses process tracing in order to understand the facts behind the change. And it is a starting point for further work in testing these intervening variables further. Now, let me uh, state some uh, theoretical references in order to contextualize our analysis in the wider literature. 
First, crisis as a critical juncture has been seen in the literature as a catalyst for change and is composed by a series of important moments or chain of events that affect agency and then ultimately change. We use uh, Giovanni Caposch's definition of critical junctures in the context of his, his historical institutionalism as these moments in which uncertainty as to the future of an institutional arrangement allows for political agency and choice to play a decisive causal role in setting an institution on a certain path of development, a path that then persists over a long period of time. So crisis as the critical juncture exacerbates uncertainty and becomes pressure for change, which can have transformative potential. The size of the new wave of immigration in particular and the reconfiguration of the party system in the Greek case were particularly crucial to define this kind of critical juncture. The second is the agency discussion and how political parties are central as these are the ones that um, will be affected by the change. They are also the ones that decide on what kind of change will take place. And in overall, they are the determining factors in the development in this particular case of external voting um, change. And as Palberg argues, while political parties have many functions in their relations with uh, diasporas, their principal interest with diaspora is as potential voters. Now looking at these issues raised by the diasporic vote, the literature is very rich in giving examples, especially on the inclusionary versus the exclusionary approaches. And the reasons why the outcome can go in one or the other direction. Having said that, the process and the outcome is rarely black and white in that there are many nuances in the way that diaspora voters are included in or excluded from national elections of their homeland. Indeed, the case that the Greek case study is a very interesting case of an inclusionary constitutional framework and an exclusionary practice before the law, obviously in 2019. These are issues then as to who should be allowed to vote from diaspora on how to exercise the right or whom to vote for. All of these have been raised by all countries that had to decide on how to engage with the diasporic vote and the outcomes and the examples vary from country to country. Uh, so for Tini, we'll be touching more on these dilemmas and issues raised during the Greek debate on the facilitation of vote. The agency contains other actors as well beyond parties that can influence the process and includes media at home or influential public intellectuals who create the debate. On the external side, the diasporic side, there are those who Maria Koinova uh, in her rich work on diasporas has termed diaspora entrepreneurs. And that term, we kind of perceive it in the form of uh, social groups important diaspora individuals, social media, and mainstream diaspora media that had the potential to affect the process. Finally, our third variable is to test the institutional environment as pressure and uh, exposing, in the Greek case, the country as outlier in what Lafleur calls the norm internationalization hypothesis. When looking at external voting, as an increasing global practice. Uh, what uh, Gamblin uh, calls a distinguishing practice of political transnationalism and the diasporas very much defined as a hybrid electoral actor. Next slide, please. I will now give a brief historical account of the Greek case after the 1975 constitution, a milestone in the relationship between the Greek state and diaspora. The period until, 19, uh, until 2009, the start of the crisis, contains some important moments in the setting up of the diasporic institutional architecture, some more successful than others, as well as unsuccessful attempts to specify 
and facilitate the constitutionally guaranteed right to vote for the Greeks abroad. So we start with the important threshold, this important moment of the start of the Hellenic Republic with the fall of the junta in 1974, and then the constitutional moment and the inclusion of Article 108, which stipulated the obligation of the Greek state to take care of emigrant Greeks abroad and of the maintenance of their ties with the fatherland. That was the first time the Greek constitution actually uh, entailed uh, um, a section on diaspora. The pressure behind that very important change was threefold. First, there were rising numbers of Greek abroad following the waves of immigration during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, on top of the earlier waves at the beginning of the 20th century and the kind of third and fourth generation. Second, the democratization of the Greek polity as a kind of a normative pressure at that time. And third, the links that the political elites in exile, most of them during the junta, had developed with the Greeks abroad. So in other words, that 1975 threshold moment uh, was a follow-up to that critical juncture of the fall of the dictatorship, the role of the agency in the interaction between political elites and diasporas, and the normative pressure of democratization coming from that kind of change the transition to democracy moment, the metapolitancy. At the same time, constitutional provisions of the diasporic vote were included in Article 51, Paragraph 4 of this constitution, stating that matters pertaining to the exercise of the right to vote by persons living outside the country may be specified by law, full stop. So that could not be applied as there was no law subsequently that passed through parliament to facilitate the application of this provision and define the implementation. We're coming into the 1980s and eight years after the constitution in 1983, we see the creation of the General Secretariat for Greeks abroad for the preservation of cultural and national identity and to foster Greek language, culture and history which started first under the aegis of the Minister of the Presidency and in 1995 went to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which had also created a special directorate for the Greeks abroad and a special deputy ministry dealing with these matters. In 1984, we also see the Europeanization of the vote following Greece's membership in the European communities and in view of the upcoming elections in 1984 and beyond, of course. The adoption of the law 1427, which was on the exercise of electoral rights for European Parliament elections for Greek citizens residing on the territory of other states of the European Economic Community, gave the right to facilitate Greek citizens to vote in European elections while being abroad. We already see the contradiction here. So for Greeks abroad, voting in the European Parliament elections was the only case where the Greek state provided the necessary arrangement that allowed them to exercise their voting rights through the setting up of polling stations in consulates in the EU states. Then the 1990s was a period of building a stronger transnational institutional architecture through the creation of uh, the Hellenic Foundation for Culture, the World Council of the Hellenes, the Institute of Education for Greeks Abroad. And that went in parallel with the rising transnational community of diaspora institutions, what Gamlin has written excellently in his book on human geopolitics, discussing the increasing importance of this global institutional layer, which had been facilitated by the fall of the communist regimes. Going back to the sticking point of the vote of the Greeks abroad, as we know, the only facilitation that the two main political parties was, uh, could do was to bring as many of their voters as possible to Greece through granting free or cheap tickets to travel via Olympic Airways. Having said that, in 2001, there was a relevant amendment of Article 51. 
asking for the specification by statute to be adopted by two thirds majority of MPs on the issue, which then made it particularly demanding for a government to be able to reach this kind of majority of 200. The most serious attempt came with the 2000 bill, which was on the exercise of the right to vote in parliamentary elections for Greeks abroad under the new democracy government, but we failed to secure this majority that was needed of two thirds and was voted uh, by 159 out of 300. Throughout the pre-2009 period, the diasporic voting issue never acquired any political urgency. It never reached the public debate, but remained for the most part an esoteric debate between political parties, merely as a matter of constitutional me mechanics. It became an internal affair between the two dominant parties of center-right, New Democracy, and center-left PASOK, approached through the prism of micro-political and electoral calculations. The diasporic vote was for the most part an unknown and unpredictable factor in the elections, a variable that could not be controlled or manipulated and whose potential to tilt the electoral outcome could go either way. So while the parties in the rhetoric would be very much in favor of facilitating voters abroad, in reality, they always considered that that was a very risky move to take. So in sum, this pre-2009 period of the Third Hellenic Republic lacked that critical juncture, which could serve as a catalyst for the implementation of this expat vote abroad. As it happened, the post-1974 period was one of uninterrupted economic growth, limited outward migration, considerable inward migration and emigration, thus weakening the urgency and topicality of the matter and confining the agency at the level of political parties and constitutional experts. It has debilitated the role that the relevant agency, parties, press, diaspora actors could potentially play in mobilizing a public debate on the subject and create pressure. And it never attained the two thirds majority when it was raised in the parliament. So it kept the issue at the level of legal arguments and clientelistic practices for too long. The Greek crisis, as we will see, was to change the impact of these variables drastically, which is the point where I will hand over to Fotini. Thank you, Othon. And also, I would like to thank the Hellenic Observatory for giving us the opportunity to present uh, our uh, research. So in this second part of our presentation, I will speak briefly about the methodology of our research, and then I will focus on the presentation of our empirical study on the issue. Next slide, please. The methodology that we adopted in order to carry out our research consisted of primary and secondary research. We carried out search and discourse analysis of the Greek parliamentary hazards covering the periods between 2009 and 2019. We examined debates in plenary sessions, but also within the Special Permanent Committee on Greeks Abroad. We also analyzed the reports of this committee and legal texts from the Greek Constitution, the European Court of Human Rights, and the EU Council decisions. Also, we carried out uh, research on selected online media in Greece and the diasporic ones to understand the public debate, the views of other analysts, diaspora actors, intellectuals, and see the development of the public discourse on the subject matter. Additionally, we conducted our own interviews and panels with experts to get deeper view of the matter. So moving on, I would like to discuss how these three variables hypothesis that often referred to, namely the crisis as a transformative juncture, the relevant actors as agents of change and the international norm hypothesis contributed to the adoption of the law on the facilitation of the diasporic vote in December 2019. We claim that this change was the outcome of these three necessary and sufficient con conditions. Next slide, please. 
So the first variable that I will focus on is the crisis as a critical juncture for reform in the diasporic vote. From 2008 onwards, Greece experienced the impact of the global financial crisis in an unprecedented scale, with a deep recession that lasted for around 10 years, resulting in the, the loss of one quarter of the country's GDP and an increased debt burden. The Greek economy came on the verge of collapse three times, including near exit from the Eurozone in the summer of 2015. And one of the most detrimental repercussions of the Greek economic crisis was a dramatic rise in the unemployment rate, which uh, reached a peak of 27.8%, with youth unemployment of 58.3% in 2013, and remained at very high levels in the subsequent years. As a result, Greece experienced a large wave of outward migration by those searching for better job prospects, and this was termed as the, the third big wave of migration in Greece's modern history. And you can see uh, the immigration flows of Greek citizens in the graph on the right-hand side. So nearly half a million people left the country, and many of these were young and educated, the so-called brain drainers. And while there has been sub substantial emphasis on the migration of young educated people, in the relevant literature, we have stressed in our various analyses at CISOX that the move out of the country concerned also many other workers of lower educational and social background, as well as foreign migrants who had come to Greece following the collapse of communism. And this new wave of migration formed in many countries a new first generation of diaspora Greeks, most of whom were added to the existing numbers of previous diasporic populations. In fact, in many cases, Greeks chose to go to places where other family members, friends, colleagues, or Greek communities all, already lived. In some cases, however, they went to new places with job opportunities in the Middle East and Far East Asia, thus expanding the geographical scope of the Greek diasporic spread. This new generation of migrants, we argue, all of them Greek citizens with strong connections with the Greek homeland formed an implicit electoral uh, pressure group with a potential political voice, a political constituency and a hybrid Greek voice abroad that had to be taken into consideration. In addition, the crisis brought up about the reconfiguration of Greece's traditional two-party system, uh, New Democracy and PASOK, its substitution uh, by the new polarization between New Democracy and Syriza, and the strengthening of smaller and other uh, ephemeral uh, parties. The mood of the Greek voters was expressed through a rising discontentment with the previously hegemonic two-party system of New Democracy and PASOK, both of whom were seen as responsible for the economic mess. The reshuffling of um, the Greek uh, party system was made evident in all the elections after 2012, whereby the center-left PASOK experienced an irreversible downturn at the benefit of the party of the radical left, Syriza, and New Democracy continued to keep its percentages as an alternative poll, yet seeing some of its voters going to the more radical right alternative, uh, alternatives of independent Greeks and the extreme right uh, Golden Dawn. So a major shift shift concerning the radical left appended the electoral geography with Syriza becoming the new left party in Greece's two-party system, a trend confirmed with the 2015 national elections of January and September. In July 2019, New Democracy came back to power with 39.7% lead. Next slide, please. Moving on to the second variable, I will focus on the role of the agents of change, namely the political parties, the media, and the diaspora actors, following a historical process tracing. The role of the political parties as a main potential beneficiaries or losers of the extended vote abroad is crucial for the understanding of how the matter came to dominate the political and public discourse. In what follows, I will show how the diasporic vote combined with the brain drain became increasingly dominant in the discussions in the party political arena. Originally, originally in the years preceding the crisis, the diasporic vote would be discussed in the parliament either in connection with the voting rights of legal migrants in Greece or as a proposal 
or question in the parliament, mostly by the party of New Democracy, who gradually became the most consistent supporter of the subject. In 2019, sorry, in 2009, New Democracy's governmental proposal was not uh, received well by the opposition parties and was outvoted in parliament. The diasporic vote was also vigorously debated within the Special Permanent Committee on Greeks Abroad, which published reports and a roadmap in uh, 2015 with a frame of priorities, which included, among others, the expat vote. In 2016, New Democracy submitted a, a law proposal concerning the expat's vote, igniting more parliamentary discussion on the subject. And this proposal was discussed in conjunction with the reform of the voting system from reinforced proportional representation to simply proportional representation, which was of particular interest to the government of Syriza. On this occasion, Syriza argued that the expat vote required a reliable census of the Greek citizens abroad. For its part, PASOK, a much smaller now party of the opposition, accused new democracy that in essence it brought back its 2009 law on the basis of its usual vote extraction mentality and suggested the election of diaspora MPs on specially designated diaspora constituencies. Um, in general, uh, New Democracy was assumed to hold a close affinity with influential sectors of the Greek diaspora in terms of conservative values, nationalist foreign policy and closer connections with church and in addition, Mitsotakis himself sought to establish a special links with a recent wave of uh, the brain drainers by appealing to their technocratic outfit. During the years uh, uh, between 2015 and 2017, um, both uh, Alexis Tsipras as prime minister and Kyriakos Mitsotakis as a leader of the opposition, competed for the affection of the diaspora with interviews in diasporic newspapers, like, for example, the National Herald. And at the same time, we observe an increased coverage uh, in the Greek newspapers on the expat vote, following the intensified political di dialogue. So gradually, but steadily, the diasporic vote became not just a prominent parliamentary issue, but a public one as well. In October 2018, the government of Syriza set up a special committee of experts to deliberate on the matter, which was a turning point in terms of committing the party of Syriza to adopt a, a more inclu a inclusionary approach. And during its deliberations, this special committee had to address uh, three main questions. Firstly, who among uh, Greeks abroad should be allowed and facilitated to vote abroad? Secondly, whom? So which list of the MPs would they vote for? And thirdly, how, how would they be facilitated? Among the, uh, the most contentious points in the committee's deliberations was whether the votes of diaspora Greeks should be counted in the final election result on the grounds that doing so would give uh, the diaspora disproportionate power over the outcome. The committee proposals were widely reported in the Greek diasporic media, raising further awareness on the matter. Uh, while the report made suggestions on the inclusivity of Greek uh, voters abroad, this did not bring about any law change by Syriza in view of the upcoming national and European elections in May 2019. Once in power, uh, New Democracy brought the issue back to, parliamentary, uh, to the parliamentary process adopting a, maxima, a maximalist inclusionary appro approach. This means all those with a Greek nationality should be allowed to vote abroad. Despite the fact that Syriza disagreed with a new bill on several points, uh, in the end it voted for the bill, which can be attributed to an increasing climate of consensus uh, that was building up between the government and other opposition parties. And fearing uh, isolation, Syriza withdrew from its initial position joining the wider accord. And at the same time, New Democracy retreated from its initial maximalist positions in order to find a common ground. Despite now that the fact that the main role was played by the, the, the political parties, the role of the diasporic Greeks and groups has to be acknowledged as well. There has been a pressing message from abroad from emerging diaspora groups, like for example, 
brain gain or new diaspora who express their views through social media uh, from the activism of individuals and other diasporic entrepreneurs. For example, a, a campaign titled I Cannot Vote was launched in June 2012 with no links with any political party or state institution, but just expressing discomfort with not being able to vote from their place of residence. Also from our own perspective, uh, the Greek diaspora project at CISOX uh, organized panels on the subject matter and uh, letters in favor of the adoption of the relevant law. In addition, the, um, the active involvement of expats in the elections for leaderships of both New Democracy and Kinal were another clear indication of the diasporic will for involvement in the electoral affairs of political parties, which is also consistent with the traditional pattern of the two political parties uh, having been politically active abroad. Um, generally, we cannot measure the impact of such external actors, but what uh, this shows us is that the mobilization of the diaspora in the new digital world is becoming increasingly obvious and multifaceted. Next slide, please. The third variable of our triptych concerns the role of the international normative environment. Apart from the structural, structural factors and the role of the agency that we analyzed above, the international norm contributed to the shifting the public discourse and political action in Greece regarding the facilitation of external voting rights. Looking at the wider uh, map of voting abroad, uh, Greece had become an outlier in the sense that the big majority of countries around the world, and specifically in Europe, was facilitating external voting. A research in 2007 showed that um, uh, external voting had been allowed by 115 countries and territories in the world. Of those countries, some two-thirds allowed all their citizens to, to vote from abroad and one third did not allow the right to an external vote, as you can see in the map. Next slide, please. A significant moment in the discussion on the vote uh, came with a debate concerning the facilitation of the voting rights of Greeks abroad and took a transnational legal dimension uh, when it, it became a subject of ju judiciary uh, with the legal argument of Sitaropoulos and Yakumopoulos versus Greece. And we argue that it constitutes a threshold event for the transnationalization of the issue. This case concerned two Greek nationals who lived in France and had not been allowed to vote in their place of residence in the 2007 Greek national elections. The Greek ambassador was forced to decline the request uh, to vote at the embassy in Paris because of the lack of any relevant domestic legislation to permit this. Subsequently, the two applicants argued before the European Court of Human Rights that because they were not allowed to vote in their place of residence, their vote, their right to vote was adversely affected. Um, in March uh, 2012, the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights in its judgment on the case held that there was no violation of uh, the Article 3 on the right of free elections pertaining to the applicants' right to vote from abroad. Despite the fact that the applicants lost, this case has been, an, an, has been important for the progress on the subject matter as it constituted the, the sole legal precedent on, on the subject. Also, the European Court of Human Rights in its judgment brought forward, forward several dimensions on the subject matter that also concerned the political and public debate. In addition, the 2018 EU Council decision constituted another important milestone of transnational pressure on the lawmakers in view of the upcoming 2019 European and national elections. The government had to ratify this decision and among other provisions, the Council encouraged EU member states to motivate their citizens residing in third non-EU countries to vote in European Parliament elections. Uh, the European elections in 2019 exposed the paradox regarding the expatriates' vote and added on the pressure to address this issue. This uh, was the fact that, um, uh, the, the, that Greek legislature uh, allowed Greeks abroad to vote for their country's representative in European elections, but not 
national ones. And this inconsistency became more apparent when there was uh, the likelihood that the European elections will take place at the same time as national elections, which didn't happen after all, as the European elections took place in May and the national ones in July 2019. So to conclude, um, and next slide, please. Uh, in December 2019, the Greek parliament voted in favor of a bill that facilitated the voting rights of the Greek diaspora. Out of a total of 296 parliamentarians present, 288 voted in favor, one abstained, and seven voted against the bill. The final bill was a compromise between the different party positions, primarily those of New Democracy and Syriza. Greeks abroad would be finally facilitated to vote from the country of residence, but under certain conditions. To have lived for a total of two years in Greece during the past 35 years, to have submitted a tax return to the Greek authorities during the election year or the one preceding this, to be able to vote only for candidates who are the party's chosen state deputies and not the parliamentarians that represent a particular reg regional constituency. And the law also required them to select areas where polling stations would be set and could only vote if there were 40 voters eligible to cast their ballots in their districts. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, the fact that this reform took place in the year 2019 it's not a mere chronological coincidence, but has to do with a number of factors connected with the long economic crisis and the significant sociopolitical changes. And also the facilitation of the diasporic vote redefines the relationship between the diaspora and the homeland. What lies ahead is the implementation of this constitutional and political change, which will entail uh, numerous practical changes and decisions. Thank you. Thank you uh, both to Othon and uh, to Fotini for this uh, presentation. I have to say that um, I found this extremely refreshing because it's the first time that I've really come across a, a rigorous, um, structured and systematic analysis of what is usually a subject which is usually talked about in anecdotal terms or in very emotive political terms. All of us of a certain generation uh, were subject to uh, uh, enticements and inducements from political parties to go back to Greece on subsidized tickets, waving flags and some kind of tribal outburst of political affiliation. Uh, but this, this uh, study for me uh, suggests that there is, there is there, uh, the makings of, of, a, of, a, of a research agenda which is rigorous and systematic and opens avenues for further research. So I thank you very much for that. I do have a couple of questions to kick us off, but could I just rem rem remind our attendees that if you wish to ask a question, use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and please identify yourself, uh, who you are and where you are, and I will uh, proceed to filter the questions through uh, to uh, our, um, uh, our participants. Now, very, very general question for either of you or both of you, and I, I leave it to you to decide. Uh, the intervening variables which you present, you left them sort of open-ended in terms of a hierarchy, or a preference which you may have uh, in your mind about which one is the most influential of these variables. So could I just uh, force you to put your cards on the table and say a bit more about what you think is the more powerful influence, which variable you think pushed uh, the discussion and the agenda on further than the other ones? Because you've said a lot about each of these variables, that they're necessary and sufficient conditions, but you haven't really put uh, uh, your hand in the fire and, 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 and told us quite clearly what you think is the predominant influence here. Othon. Um, yes, this is um, uh, a very good question and it's kind of natural to ask this. It's just that, um, you know, when we kind of present a, a tentative causality, we have to look at uh, how the kind of variables interact with each other. So it's very difficult to say, for instance, that you can only use one variable and that will give you the explanation while some, but that something happens. One thing that we can say with certainty is that um, without the agency, without uh, the political parties in particular, you can have you know, no change whatsoever, whatever, um, whatever um, uh, pressure you have. Now, if I had to say what would be the less significant of the three, I would say is the normative pressure because during the 1990s and the 2000s in particular, 
there's been an increasing kind of um, transnational and global practice uh, of voting. And yet, you know, Greece will continue along its own kind of way of uh, exclusion. So that normative pressure, while it's very interesting to discuss in order to contextualize Greece as an outlier, I believe is not, it, it could be the less significant, but you definitely need that kind of threshold moment. And that's is our argument. You need the threshold, the critical juncture in order to create the environment. That's why I also made in my part of the presentation that kind of con the kind of distinction between a period of affluence and emigration that didn't, you know, didn't give the need for anyone to discuss the topic and how with the emigration. So if I were just to make a long story short to conclude what was the crucial factor was the wave of emigration that really put the question there. It's like, you know, a very uh, fresh and dynamic part which was very attached to Greece, left all of a sudden very quickly. And I think that was actually a very big pressure for the parties to consider. What do you mean? Um, I think that uh, uh, we have to take under consideration that um, uh, the parties were the main uh, actors that actually sifted the, the, the agenda. I mean, they placed the, the diasporic vote uh, in the epicenter of the political dialogue when speaking about diasporic issues. And this also uh, helps the agenda move in the public discourse. So I would place um, uh, the political actors uh, uh, first uh, as who has influenced the most. Uh, but also sometimes we need to see uh, uh, about the influence and the gravity of influence uh, in, in different periods. Because if we look at the Syriza uh, government, um, uh, when they decided to, to form this committee, it was interesting because before they were they had um, they had their um, uh, a different conception about uh, the diasporic vote, but they changed uh, their minds. Um, I believe it has to do with uh, the EU Council decision uh, that forced them to 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 place. Uh, the, the diasporic uh, vote uh, in the center of uh, their political agenda. Okay, thank you very much. We have got a number of questions coming in. Some of them are quite practical in terms of uh, looking at constraints and who qualifies to vote and, and, and those kinds of issues. But before uh, doing uh, answering those questions, let me ask you a, um, a broader question. And this is to do with political contestation. Uh, you made a lot uh, of play in your presentation about the role of political parties as agents of change. And of course, the major political parties in the Greek uh, parliamentary scene have always had very specific positions on why or, or not they want to include diasporic votes uh, uh, in, in the electoral cycle. Uh, so my, my question is, uh, what made them change their mind in terms of feeling secure that by including the diasporic vote in the electoral cycle, they could actually secure the vote themselves. It seems to me strange that any political party in Greece would go down the route of saying, yes, let's allow uh, the diaspora to vote without feeling quite confident that they would be uh, gaining from this. Uh, one of the questions from the audience, Konstantinos Yorubusakis asks, is it safe to assume that the Greek vote abroad has the same preference distribution as in Greece, which is a continuation of the same question? Uh, often, Fotini? Um, I think that um, apart from uh, being safe, uh, there was like, it, it came to that point uh, from the pressure also from the diaspora itself, that the political parties could not afford not to move to, towards this change. Uh, and also we have to see this in the context of the crisis. Uh, it was the, the matters of the crisis and the brain drain was such such a, a central point of the discussion in the public discourse that uh, the parties had to uh, to make a move, and also of course it helped that new democracy came in power that they were they they always traditionally wanted um, uh, had this maximalist view and they wanted um, uh, the incorporation of uh, the diaspora in uh, in the voting. Um. If I can add to this, uh, traditionally, uh, it's interesting that during the 1980s, just to go a bit back in history, it was mostly PASOK that was uh, better associated with um, 
uh, with the diaspora. That had to do with uh, Papandreou's as well, own kind of pack movement and links with um, with Greeks in Sweden, uh, you know, or elsewhere in Canada. Uh, the uh, PASOK, and that's why, you know, in the 1980s, that issue became uh, more prominent and also by creating that kind of general secretariat. Um, so we see in the 1980s that we've got that kind of affinity. Gradually, uh, both parties, I believe that um, they were obviously in favor of in their rhetoric of, um, uh, of facilitating voters abroad, but they just couldn't control them. And uh, buying tickets for them was a certain means of controlling voters uh, into their favor. Uh, gradually, new democracy after 2009 became much more confident. But what I think is that um, uh, with uh, Mitsotakis in power, there was a kind of a combination of new democracy feeling closer to diaspora in terms of a, the more conservative nationalistic kind of orientation, which is obviously ideologically closer to a new democracy. Let's not forget that Pasok had disappeared by then. I mean, had kind of did not disappeared, but it had, you know, dissipated into those small percentages. And also into Takis's technocratic kind of approach, that was also something which was much more um, kind of um, um, closer to the to the the brain drainers and the kind of the you know that kind of younger generation that left in search of better work. So gradually new democracy felt much more confident about it. I believe that the Syriza was much more wavering between obviously a modernizing discourse that had to include those Greeks abroad, but they kind of knew also that they wouldn't be able to get as much as they could in terms of votes, uh, you know, if they allowed this uh, to happen. Um, uh, in the end, of course, because they had started that committee, that moment was also very important. That creation of the committee of experts was particularly significant in starting that whole debate. They kind of felt that they just had to, to proceed with this. But it felt increasingly certain that new democracy was feeling much more comfortable in terms of uh, reaching out to diaspora vote. Okay, let's move on to a couple of other questions which have to do with the constraints that Fotini outlined uh, in, in, her, in her part of the presentation. Uh, Harry Sakalot has asked, what is the rationale for the first constraint that you've had to be resided uh, in Greece for two years out of the last 35, I think it is. Why are we excluding long-term Greek residents abroad uh, when they have the same rights as everybody else, especially if they satisfy all the other parameters? Uh, Michael Kalyasos asked, what does it mean to have lived in Greece for two years in the past 35? How do you establish that? How many days per year? Uh, how does one establish this within Schengen? So there are practical considerations here, which uh, uh, many of our participants are putting. And I, perhaps you can enlighten us a bit. Perhaps you can give us a bit of context and background. Is, is this a way of excluding people? Who introduced these constraints? Which political parties wanted what out of this uh, particular set of parameters? Uh, I think that uh, um, um, the, these constraints, uh, first of all, they needed to come into a consensus, all the parties. So um, I think that the two years, uh, this restraint was be, um, because uh, parties like Kinal and Syriza pushed towards this direction, um, opposing the opinion of, uh, of new democracy that it should include everyone who is a Greek citizen. This means that uh, their parents uh, or one of their parents are Greek citizens and therefore uh, uh, in extension they are Greek citizens. So I think uh, this, this is, uh, yeah, it, it was in order to, uh, to come mm -hmm. into a consensus between the parties. So uh, they, they, um, but they for me, what, are the fears here? What, what, what are the fears here? What is it about one particular political party like Syriza, for example, that wants to introduce certain kinds of constraints as opposed to another political party, which was much more open about having a blanket acceptance for the diaspora to vote? It is because it, um, it, is, um, it is a result that no one knows how it's going to be. It's the volatility of the result. So uh, I think all the parties uh, are afraid of this, of this the result. And however, exactly because uh, everyone has this uh, preconception that uh, uh, the diaspora uh, has a better affiliation uh, with uh, the right wing parties, and especially this is based also on the um, uh, on the idea um, that uh, uh, the Greeks in America vote uh, vote for the Republican Party. Uh, so there is uh, there is this idea that Greeks abroad would would go for more of uh, the right-wing parties. 
Awesome. Um, it was, um, it became apparent uh, uh, after the committee of experts uh, gave its um, opinion on the, uh, on the, you know, the right um, uh, of uh, citizens to vote abroad that then uh, the government of Syria started to dragging its feet, uh, you know, about it. I mean, uh, while it had kind of um, uh, started the ball rolling, uh, obviously at the insistence prior of new democracy that kept on bringing the bill to the government, to the parliament, uh, it was very difficult also to be able to address the imminent elections. And uh, one thing that um, uh, Mitsotakis did successfully was to uh, adopt uh, the, the diasporic vote as one of the flagships uh, of the pre-electoral campaign as well. Um, so it was um, ob obviously they favored a much more inclusionary approach. One could never know how much an inclusionary approach can be inclusionary because uh, even when you look at other practices in other countries, uh, you know, we do talk about inclusion, but then each country has its own kind of uh, inclusionary standards. And, and even sometimes uh, it uh, treats populations differently uh, in terms of uh, facilitating to vote. I'm having in mind the example of Orban, for instance, that is, makes it much more difficult the facilitation of vote in Western countries, for instance, because he knows the voters are gonna be critical towards his illiberal regime, but he's much more facilita facilitating with the Hungarians that live in Serbia or in Romania, who are much closer to the border of, of Hungary. And he knows that you know, they can favor him in election. So I believe that uh, you know, whatever, you know, we understand the conditions, obviously, we know that there are a lot of restrictions that some may agree or some may disagree. The proof of the pudding is going to be in the implementation and how this is going to be implemented. I mean, what kind of facilitation is going to be given? And also another consideration we take is that uh, usually Greeks abroad, they don't uh, tend you know, to go and vote en masse. The experience of the European election shows us that uh, either they are a bit indifferent or some of them have a choice to, you know, to do the European elections in the country where they live or to vote for their uh, motherland, they may choose you know, either side. Um, so we need to see, that's why it, it, the moment of vote was important in itself. It is a kind of an inclusionary moment, but we need to see how this is going to implement it because as everything, adoption is one thing, implementation is the most important thing. Uh Okay, let's get back to the implementation in a second, but you've partly answered a question by Pandos Yatsevis, a recent LSE alum, who asked, how would you compare the specific requirements of Greeks voting abroad versus other European approaches? Is Greece unique here? So there's the comparative element of your study uh, or potential future studies, which is being raised here by Pandos. And it's echoed in the question of Konstantinos Buchaya, whose question is very specifically to do with uh, the nature of representation in parliament of the diasporas. He says that France and Italy reserve parliamentary seats for their diasporas. This means that the diaspora has its own deputies in parliament. Can we expect a day when Greeks abroad will have their own representative? Uh, he also adds that, for instance, and no doubt CSOX knows best because of its research, in Britain we have over 75,000 Greeks eligible to vote. Uh, that is just about the size of a constituency uh, in Greece. So what can we expect? Uh, this is part of the implementation, but it's also part of a broader comparative element. What do other countries do? How is Greece different? Is it unique? Can it adopt and adapt to existing standards? And what will happen actually uh, when the vote gets, it, when the vote is in? Fotini? Um, I think that uh, Greece was at the same level as uh, Ireland. Uh, if we want to compare, there, there were two diasporas with uh, very big, uh, two countries with a very big diasporas, and they were the two outliers um, uh, of the diasporic vote uh, in comparison to all uh, other European countries. Uh, now, on the specifics of uh, the requirements of every country, uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm not very sure how, how to answer. Um, I know that uh, Italy uh, follows uh, quite in, an inclusionary approach and France. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. 
Um, that uh, uh, is a point that uh, I, I believe requires a good comparative analysis. The, the answer, the quick answer to this is that uh, uh, every country adopts a kind of a different model in terms of uh, how many to, um, uh, to engage. In other words, what kind of restrictions to put uh, you know, in the years that they have been in the country or whatever. It also varies as to whether they will um, vote for diaspora representatives or for those who are the deputies, uh, you know, in, in Homeland. Uh, and um, uh, so, you know, and also how inclusionary uh, the, the overall uh, process is going to be. Um, that I believe requires a very, you know, interesting um, comparative uh, study uh, of uh, how countries, uh, you know, behave. There are some countries that are, know that they are particularly um, affected by elections um, abroad. Like when we, for instance, look at countries like Romania or Bulgaria, because of that kind of very big immigration wave, uh, from these countries, and these countries, and those people abroad, they actually keep in touch with politics at home, and often they can also make a difference. I'm thinking of the case of um, uh, President Ioannis in Romania, who has a particular connection with the diasporic uh, population. Uh, then there are other uh, systems uh, uh, that, like, for instance, uh, in the case of Turkey, where Erdogan, uh, you know, uh, an, an autocrat, basically, he kind of mobilizes the uh, diasporic population abroad and does that actively in every electoral campaign, but he also knows how the Turkish diaspora is kind of divided because it's not a homogeneous kind of um, the body. There are those who are in favor of the regimes, but there are others who are either left-wingers or there are those who have been expelled by the, by the country. So there are some countries, uh, what I mean to say that this is not a common kind of um, uh, practice by all countries. Other countries pursue a very rigorous kind of electoral campaign when they see that they can mobilize uh, voters uh, in their favor. Others will kind of, you know, go in a much more kind of neutral um, uh, way. And uh, there are also, the other thing is that it varies from country to country what kind of facilitation you give. For instance, there is a postal voting in some countries and in the United States, we've seen the, the problems with postal voting with, uh, you know, how that was also manipulated by the uh, Trump elites there. Uh, uh, and others, you know, they, they give other types of, of facilitation. If I am to criticize the system of facilitation of, you know, for the Greek case, obviously I'm delighted that, you know, the, the wheel has started to roll and that there is this kind of more inclusionary process of facilitation. I believe that uh, in terms of, uh, you know, how this will be facilitated, we are still very much behind many other countries. If, for instance, we are to have a polling you know, stations in the consulate, it's going to be particularly difficult for people, for instance, to go from Scotland, you know, miles and miles away to kind of try and find a place to vote. So that's why I keep on saying that all this is, the implement, is in the implementation and it varies from country to country to what kind of impact and what kind of campaign every government decides to have with its own diaspora. If I could add to this uh, uh, regarding the implementation uh, of the law, uh, this will be very challenging. And according to also to what Alex Vizatos has said, uh, and he warned that, uh, that proving the presence in Greece for two years will be a source of, uh, of problems, arguing that supporting documents uh, dating uh, decades back might uh, have been uh, lost or destroyed. And also we have to take into account uh, when we talk, talk about implementation, uh, the notorious bureaucracy in Greece, uh, whereby there will be a lot of challenges to implement such a change and to, to include the voters from ab abroad in the electoral uh, procedure. Okay, uh, let me just remind uh, our audience that if you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and I will transfer your questions to Othon and Fotini. Let's uh, change direction. I know you've been talking about implementation and constraints and restraints and what may happen in the future, but let's change the discussion slightly back to the research agenda and look a bit at methods. Um, both Kevin Featherstone and Susanna Verney have asked uh, whether you could say a bit more about for example, how your data fed into weighing your different intervening variables. 
Uh, what analysis did you make of the parliamentary speeches? Did you use textual data analysis? And how did this feed into your conclusions? So uh, could you say something more about your methods and your findings? Because I think this is an important part of what you're presenting. This is a new research agenda. You mentioned process tracing. Uh, and I think there is a part of our audience who would like to know more about this research specific part of your presentation. So we have followed discourse analysis, not textual analysis. Uh, we have used uh, different, uh, different keywords uh, in uh, the online uh, uh, parliamentary answers uh, by using the keywords, uh, if I may say them in Greek, uh, homogenia, diaspora, apodimos, hellenismos. So different, uh, because in Greece we have different words of uh, defining our diaspora. Um, and th these were uh, th th this was the general framework of setting our of our research. Later, we started uh, adding also uh, the the diasporic vote as a um, uh, as a dimension. So this gave us um, more specifically uh, uh, the those uh, the, those sessions that they they uh, they concerned us. Uh, however, the wider um, the wider uh, political engagement issues helped us in order to frame uh, our uh, um, uh, our specific uh, issue. Um, also, um, we used media discourse analysis, and uh, this helped us also to understand uh, how the uh, public dialogue uh, developed. And also, this helped us. Uh, the media analysis helped us also to. Uh, to search, to go back to uh, the, the sessions in the Hellenic Parliament and see what uh, else we could search for, what is important and what was uh, the talk of, of the day. Um, also, uh, in our interviews and uh, discussions with uh, experts and in panels that we organized, we managed to get a more rounded mm -hmm. view of, uh, of the subject. So uh, I, th this is this is main this is our main research uh, agenda and methodology. Can I add something to this? Uh, yes, I would like. Uh, and um, uh, indeed, uh, the, uh, our initial uh, in intention and um, uh, and uh, decision uh, was to go uh, directly to the parliamentary concerts and uh, start looking by putting the term and then looking at the frequency of the debate and then starting to see what kind of positions the different governments would take and what kind of issues they were also addressing. So it was also, not, uh, we could see then, they wanted to see the frequency of the issues as well, uh, in the sense that uh, there was a talk about um, taxation, there was a talk about uh, the language and culture. Uh, there was a talk about how diaspora could help economically the countries in terms of investment. So there were various issues that were being discussed um, in the parliament. Uh, so in this particular presentation, what we have tried to do uh, is to uh, zoom in uh, to the issue of uh, vote in particular. So we just left the other. Uh, they were significant at the beginning, but as it were, and because we had an outcome and, uh, you know, and uh, this transformative potential that we wanted to emphasize, it was actually the vote that helps us understand the impact of the crisis on that kind of change. Uh, and at the same time, we are also trying with this um, uh, presentation to offer a way uh, in order to do particular research also. So one could, for instance, say, I'm going to look at the position of parties exclusively and then do a more quantitative analysis or a computational analysis of how often the issue of vote appears and what it tells us about the discourse and the positions and whether there are any differences between parties. With Fotini, then we thought that it was interesting to give the wider atmospherics as well. That's why we also included in our work the other variables and then looking also at selected me media you know, the two newspapers that we emphasized our work was mostly Cathiberini because there were a lot of articles about diaspora as well as Tovima and also the Ephemerida Tosidacton. So we had, you know, the kind of uh, right center, uh, you know, and, and, and left wing uh, uh, argument. We looked at some very representative um, uh, newspapers which were diasporic uh, newspapers. And then we also used some information 
from our interview. It's a very qualitative kind of, um, you know, of, of analysis that combines all these kind of, uh, you know, methods of, of, of tracing uh, and trying to understand, you know, the discourses and the nuances in the debate. And if okay. I may add, uh, also we can see an increase uh, in the coverage of, uh, of uh, diasporic vote towards uh, uh, 2018, 2019, especially in the diasporic media, um, we see like a crescendo of uh, of um, of coverage uh, on the on this particular issue. Okay, uh, Kevin Featherstone had a follow up question, which he was typing into the Q and A while you were speaking often, and in the process you answered it. So uh, thank you very much for for gazing into your crystal ball and, and answering that question as well. Let me take you back to one of your intervening variables because. Um, you talked about the, um, the crisis as being a transformative uh, variable in a sense. It, it, it was the Eurozone crisis, the Greek uh, economic crisis that was the real context in which this, uh, this parliamentary consensus was forged and, and, and this electoral law uh, was, this diasporic electoral law was passed. But it seems to me that what you're really saying, if I haven't misinterpreted you, it's not the economic crisis, it's the brain drain. It's the it's it's the the emigration part of it that you think really tipped uh, the process uh, over the edge uh, and created this electoral law. Would that be fair enough to say? Would it be fair enough to say that you have to narrow it down very much to 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 the brain drain and not simply put it in the general context of economic crisis? Othon, unmute yourself, Othon, please. Yeah. I can I can respond first, and then Fotini can add. First of all, just let me say hi to Kevin. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Kevin, for hosting us. And it's wonderful to have your questions as well as all the other questions, of course. Um, so what I would like to say in terms of uh, that particular issue is that, uh, yes, for me, is the, the issue of uh, the drain, brain drain and that kind of particular uh, uh, generation that left the country that was the loud voice, uh, the, you know, the exit with a voice that kind of could not be stopped and it had to be uh, taken into consideration. But then that big and massive exit was the outcome of the crisis. It wouldn't have happened uh, uh, otherwise. Um, so in that sense, I believe the two are very much interlinked, but the agency of the, of the, of the, um, uh, you know, the migration uh, and that kind of process was something that really, really made a difference. And I would also like to point something else as well here. Uh, in, in what helped the consensus as well. There was this kind of remarkable uh, phenomenon uh, during the years of 2018-19 uh, when the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the country was exiting the crisis uh, and things were appearing to be a little bit better, but even a little bit before that with Syriza in power that um, both parties kind of stopped using uh, you know, populist discourse uh, in terms of what related to crisis. We saw populist discourse in nationalistic issues that had to do with the, the Macedonian issue, but we didn't see so much, uh, you know, in the context of the economy and crisis. There was a kind of a consensus, very reluctant from both sides, especially from the side of Syriza, that they had to work towards a certain economic policy and there is no way, um, you know. So that also created a climate of less and less populism. And I believe that that also, you know, created that other kind of context and atmospheric that helped you know, the two parties also to, um, you know, to find a common ground on how they would deal with um, uh, the, the brain and the human uh, drainers, you know, that had left the country. Uh, after all, that was uh, a big, um, you know, trauma for both uh, parties and for the whole of the you know, of, of the Greek society, that you know the, the governments could not play with. And the other thing is that uh, historically the rhetoric of political parties, all the political parties, were ne was never against vote. It's just that they've never had the opportunity to actually uh, you know put the law and vote and vote for it. So uh, in, in that sense, I believe that it was a kind of the right climate. Uh, in order to kind of think jointly on this, obviously some with more parties with more reservations than, than others. Um, if if I, I may add one uh, one small point is 
uh, in order to exemplify this brain drain issue, um, there was this uh, brain gain initiative uh, that had begun an online uh, petition to push for the vote uh, from abroad. And in, tw uh, in spring, somewhere in 2019, uh, there were 70,000 uh, signatories. And um, of course, this gained uh, media attention. What I want to say is that this uh, uh, whole brain drain also discussion and also this diaspora entrepreneurs pushed to towards this direction. And of course, the discussion on brain drain also pushed uh, the, uh, yeah, pushed the, uh, the, implement the um, facilitation of the diasporic vote. Yes, I had a sort of generic question on the relationship between the brain drain prospective electorate and the older diaspora perspective electorate. But I suppose uh, Michael Skalias has put it much better in the question he's just submitted when he said, would it be interesting to examine statistically the likely effects of the participation constraints on the political outcome and to link those to the party proposing each constraint? For instance, the two out of the 35 year requirement is obviously something which uh, will enable the newer wave of immigrants to vote, the brain drain to vote. Uh, do part, have parties calculated this? Is this something which is something which we can trace statistically and include in, in, in future studies? Odini, can you help with that? <laughs> I, th I think it's a very difficult uh, question. So the question. I'm trying to, um, to think of how to go about it, but uh, maybe I, there, there needs to be more research about it. But um, me, sorry to interrupt, but it seems to me that there is something here uh, about your argument, which is very much based on the brain drain, as, as you said, and I think we all agree that this is a significant factor. But this law also captures a large number of other people who aren't part of this brain drain, who form part of a very much older diaspora in Europe and beyond. And I suppose the question is, what kind of calculations have there been in terms of which electorate will actually show up? Uh, who is going to vote and what the consequences of this might be on calculations that parties have made? Um, I can respond partly to this. Obviously, I cannot base my response on uh, any kind of uh, analysis or inside knowledge on what kind of uh, calculations the parties did. But my guess is that uh, we are talking about uh, that kind of restriction of years uh, for those who can vote that would uh, primarily favor, you know, new democracy. Uh, and this is because uh, during the 1990s and 2000s, what we are witnessing is, um, uh, first of all, uh, a remigration. So either many Greeks are coming back from areas, historical kind of areas like, uh, you know, the Soviet, the former Soviet Union, uh, or uh, we see, um, uh, you know, other, um, uh, or even from Australia and other parts. So, I, I mean, apart from uh, those East Europeans or others that also came uh, to find work in Greece, the ones who decided to uh, leave the country, they did it out of uh, choice. Now, our colleague um, Manolis um, Pratsinakis has written a very interesting article uh, on uh, the distinction between uh, choice versus being forced. Um, and uh, during the period of 1990s and 2000s, it was very much a choice for Greeks to leave because Greek economy was growing anyway. So the ones who were leaving, they were leaving the country in order to go for better job opportunities abroad. Um, compared to the post 2009, where the majority actually were people that had to leave the country because unemployment was very high. So in whatever form you see that, my guess is that uh, new democracy felt much closer to that kind of emigration and also the cutoff point in a way that um, they put in the law is, might, must also be much more favorable in terms of those who decide if we assume that these are kind of technocrats brain drainers, uh, people who are looking for, you know, job, good job opportunities. And in that sense, maybe, the, you know, they can associate with a more democratic, the technocratic, you know, new democracy. This is my kind of guess, because obviously, you know, if you go back in history, these people are not involved anyway. So we're not talking about these past waves anymore. 
Okay, before we close, I have one, one last question which I'd like to ask, and maybe it's something which I didn't hear properly, and you can enlighten me. Somewhere buried in your presentation, I think often you use the term Europeanization. And I was wondering whether you use the term Europeanization in its academic sense, or whether you were simply referring to Greece in a European context and comparing Greek you know, electoral practices with other states. Could you uh, enlighten us? Yes, I used um, the term intentionally in the academic sense. Uh, uh, most of the times when I use the term Europeanization, I want to use it in the academic um, sense because uh, it kind of um, you know, shows uh, that uh, there are changes towards a certain uh, direction. And obviously, you know, uh, one of us, and I mean, especially Kevin, who's attended, has written so extensively about Europeanization and influence. And um, we have seen the influence of Europeanization on party politics uh, in all the countries uh, through their uh, belonging also to the bigger regional, uh, the bigger um, ideological families uh, in the European context. So that is something unavoidable. But what's interesting about European elections in particular is that uh, while the, you know, that, that decision was particularly pivotal, because it did allow Greeks to be able to vote abroad um, uh, and th they were facilitated that. It's of course, it's a, uh, it's a mystery how the political elites in Greece were actually allowed to, uh, you know, to get away with not facilitating the uh, voters for national elections and how the clientelistic Greek system continued kind of to operate uh, in the way that it did. Um, but um, I did use it in the sense that there was some kind of a change and a different kind of thinking that started in the 1980s, but as many things in Greece, it kind of takes very, very long time in order to be able to do the reform. And then obviously once you do the reform, you have to see how this is going to be implementing. Doing those kinds of reforms, especially when it consists and it relates to party politics and those kinds of uh, electoral logistics and calculations, it can actually make decisions, you know, uh, drag on longer and longer, which brings me to the original argument, how that crisis was so important in terms of, you know, giving that kind of um, environment for the change to, to, to happen. Okay, one last question has just come in from somebody who I think you know often, Yorgos Milonadis asks, what is the range of predictions, yours or other analysts or politicians or commentators, about the number of people that are likely to vote under this law? Uh, what, are, what kinds of figures are we talking about? Does anybody have a ballpark figure? Um, uh, yes. Actually, um, there's a new online platform uh, that has been set up by the government for the Greek citizens uh, to live abroad. And it will allow them to register their details so they can um, uh, cast their ballot at their place of residence. So it's, uh, the Ministry of Interior says that uh, they are expecting 300,000 Greek citizens abroad uh, that they will want to register to vote in the next election. And this is uh, this is the first uh, um, this is the first estimation after the voting of uh, of uh, the 2019 uh, uh, law bill. Okay, we are um, running out of time, and we've also, in a sense, run out of questions. And I'd just like to wrap up by, uh, apart from thanking you both for 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 joining us today and 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 making it possible to have a Hellenic Observatory Research Seminar on this topic, I'd like to thank you both for uh, providing an academic setting for a hot political debate. And I think what you've done, apart from your own work, uh, apart from your own work, is also uh, open the research agenda for future work. Because I think the questions you've received and the answers that you've given show that there's a lot of scope here for uh, a comparative work, for methodological refinement, and for other aspects of digging a bit deeper into your variables, which I think uh, is going to be very fruitful in the future. But I think from your comments, I also would suggest that implementation is going to be the most indicative factor here. Whether we actually get to this, uh, uh, get through this process and get to the stage where the diaspora actually votes and is actually represented in parliament 
uh, is going to be a, a, a tremendous step forward. And I think there are so many constraints and restraints here that it could be a long time before we see this particular electoral uh, law come into fruition. Uh, Othon Fotini, personally, I'd like to thank you very, very much for joining us today and sharing your thoughts. I wish you and your research uh, the best of luck. Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, all the members of our audience uh, for participating today, uh, for listening, for putting questions. And may I remind you that even though this is our last research seminar of the year, we have another event on Monday, the left in power, as you can see on the screen, reflection on series as promise and achievements with Euclides Sakalotos. I invite you all to attend that. Uh, Othon, Fotini, thank you very much and see you soon again at the HO. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you.